Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you, those of you who are students, great pleasure to welcome you to hear this, this fascinating talk, and to those of you who are visitors, welcome to our campus. We are gathered here in the Peter B. Lewis Building, which is the home of the Weatherhead School of Management here at Case Western Reserve. And I want to thank the members of the media who are here today for coming, and I also want to acknowledge the staffs of the Federal Reserve, the Weatherhead School, and of course our central administration for all the work they did to put this event together. And I do want to thank our students in advance because I know that you are going to ask terrifically insightful questions. I don't know exactly what those questions will be, I should tell you, <laughs> but I know that our students are so bright that I can count on the quality of their inquiries. Today I have the honor of introducing Sandra Pianalto, President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. A native of Italy who immigrated to this country when she was just five years old, Sandy has long symbolized the best of the American dream. A 1976 graduate of the University of Akron, she joined the Cleveland Fed in 1983. In 1993, she was named First Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. A decade later, she became the 10th chief executive of what is officially known as the 4th District Federal Reserve Bank at Cleveland. I want to pause a moment and ask you to think a little bit about the dates I just mentioned. In 1976, our nation celebrated its bicentennial. A gallon of gas cost 59 cents, and the prime interest rate stood at 6.25%. Seven years later, when Sandy joined the Cleveland Fed, the United States witnessed the worst year of bank closures since the Great Depression. The prime rate had almost doubled, standing at a whopping 11%, and that gallon of gas now cost $1.22. A decade later, when Sandy ascended to the number two spot at the Cleveland Fed, the price of gas had actually declined a bit. The prime rate was at about the same place it was when Sandy graduated from Akron about 25 years earlier. If you're charting these figure in your mind, a roller coaster at Cedar Point captures the nature of the trajectory, up and down and all around. Finally, in 2003, when Sandy assumed her current position, gas had climbed to $1.64, and we naively complained at how astoundingly expensive that was. <laughs> the prime, meanwhile, was down at 4%, a number so low it had last been seen in 1958. I mention all of this for two reasons. First, Sandy long ago said she joined the Federal Reserve because she enjoyed an intellectual challenge. I think it's fair to say that over time, our economy has given her all the challenge she could have hoped for, and maybe a little bit more. Second, last week, Sandy attended a forum that marked the 100th anniversary of the meeting that marked the creation of the Federal Reserve, as she and her current Fed colleagues consider the lessons of the past decades and how those could help with today's challenges, Sandy offered this observation. History, she said, has an ability to administer a dose of humility. That seemingly simple sentence highlights why our region, and indeed our nation, is so fortunate to have Sandy as a leading economic voice. Despite all that she has accomplished, Sandy is remarkably modest. She fully embraces the role of a servant leader, a person committed to well-considered efforts that benefit people, communities, and our nation. She matches that public spirit with a keen mind and a passion for understanding. For Sandy, the presidency of the Cleveland Fed is not about ego, but about contribution. She has that rare gift of gravitas, the presence and character that commands attention without seeking it. For all those reasons and more, I am eager to hear what Sandy has to say about this unprecedented moment in the history of the Fed and in our national and global economy. Please join me in welcoming one of the voting members of the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, Sandy Pianalto. Thank you, Barbara, um, for that wonderful introduction. I've been introduced by many, many people over the years, and, and I'm not, I've not had an introduction like that. That was just um, beautiful. I was happy to just sit there and, and listen <laughs> and have you do this. But, um, but I know all of you know what um, an asset um, President Snyder has been to Case Western Reserve University. Um, you've, uh, you've watched this university 
just flourish under her leadership. But um, I want you to note that she's also an asset to Northeast Ohio. Uh, her voice, um, in the, as she said, we were facing challenges, and her voice has been an important voice in helping us steer through the many challenges we're facing here in Northeast Ohio. So we're privileged um, to have um, Barbara Snyder as a leader in, in, this, in, in this community. So thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I know it's, I'm excited to hear from all of you. Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. I, I know, though, that um, some of you were mandated to be here as part of your class, so, but I'm glad you are here. Um, and, and Barbara's introduction, you know, commented that uh, even, I mean, I've been with the Fed for a long time and I've seen a lot of, a lot of um, challenges, ups and downs, as Barbara mentioned, a, a roller coaster. But these past eight years that I've been president have, have really been very challenging years and, and, and a set of roller coaster years. But I'll have to say that I can't recall a policy action that the Fed has taken that has received as much attention and vigorous debate as the decision we made at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting on November 3rd. I'm referring, of course, to the decision to add an additional $600 billion to our balance sheet by purchasing $600 billion worth of U.S. Um, Treasury securities by the middle of next year. And that's a decision that I voted for and I continue to endorse today. And in my, in my remarks today, I'm going to discuss um, how the economic recovery is unfolding, and I'll focus particularly on the stubborn nature of our high unemployment rates, and also my concern about the uncomfortably low inflation rates that we're seeing. And then I'll explain why I supported the decision to purchase uh, additional Treasury securities. So let me begin by telling you something you are already painfully aware of, and that is that the economy has been through the worst recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s. The downward spiral began with the housing crisis that was then followed by a financial crisis, which led to the financial crisis. Financial markets froze up, uh, production collapsed, and employment plummeted. The Federal Reserve responded very aggressively to the crisis. Uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the committee that sets monetary policy for the Fed, responded quickly by bringing short-term interest rates down to nearly zero. And we also helped lower long, longer-term interest rates by purchasing approximately $1.7 trillion worth of mortgage-backed securities, agency debt, and Treasury securities. Overall, this resulted in what the Federal Reserve refers to as an extremely accommodative monetary policy. I believe that this policy, this policy stance, has been very effective. Uh, we avoided the worst possible scenario, which was a repeat of the Great Depression. Yet, we still have a lot of challenges. Uh, today, the economy is growing, and it has officially emerged from the recession. But the recovery has been extremely gradual. Research uh, indicates that recessions that are followed by financial crisis, or, I'm sorry, that recessions that are preceded by or caused by financial crisis, um, that following those recessions, the recovery is more, uh, is more gradual because the downturn is so much more severe in, in these recessions that are followed, uh, that are preceded by financial crisis, that the downturn is much more severe and therefore the recovery period takes uh, longer than normal. In fact, we've seen the slowest recovery that we've experienced since the post-World War II period. For recessions since 1948, the average length of time it took for the real GDP to return to its pre-recession peak was just over 12 months. But we've already had 33 months of this business cycle and in the third quarter of this year, real, GP, real GDP still remains a full percentage point below its 2007 peak. In our situation, the remnants of the financial crisis are still holding back economic progress. Households have been much more cautious in this environment. Uh, consumers have sharply cut back on spending, and they continue to lower their debt levels and save more. And of course, the housing market continues to remain stressed. And finally, in, in the face of weak demand, companies are still very hesitant about hiring and, and bringing people back onto their payrolls. 
so the economy is growing, although, and although it is growing, it just doesn't feel like much of a recovery. Our economy is digging itself out of a deep hole and continues to pr perform below its potential. In fact, uh, based on real GDP estimates that were revised in July, we now know that output in, in the years 2007, 2008, and even last year were actually lower than was previously thought. So in other words, the economy began this recovery deeper in the hole, and we have more ground to make up than everyone thought even earlier this year. And nowhere is the depth of this hole more evident than in our labor markets. Right now, nearly 15 million Americans are unemployed, and we have an unemployment rate that stands at 9.6 percent. While it was encouraging uh, last, uh, to learn that in October, 150,000 jobs were added to the um, job market, we still have a long way to go just to reach the 207 um, employment numbers. And an average, when our economy is in more normal uh, environment, 150,000 people enter the workforce in a month. So the fact that we added 150,000 jobs is just making room for those people that are entering the workforce. We've got to add a whole lot more than 150,000 jobs per month to make a dent in this unemployment rate um, and to get the 15 million people that are unemployed uh, back to work. Troubling as these numbers are, What's even more troubling is how long people are remaining out of work. Uh, about half of the people who, un who are currently unemployed have been unemployed for six months or more. In, uh, in another severe recession that this country faced, um, the one that uh, Barbara referred to back in 18, uh, 1982, the average duration of unemployment peaked at 21 weeks. The average duration of the unemployed in this recession is already at 34 weeks. So these long spells of unemployment are a problem because they can lead to uh, some very unfortunate consequences. Labor economists have repeatedly shown that the longer people are out of work, the harder it is for them to find a job. Research also shows us that when we, people are not working, they lose their skills. And, uh, and so right now, People are, because of this amount of time that they're out of work, uh, we're, they are losing a lot of valuable skills. When people do return to work after a downturn, they're most productive when they can go back to the same job they had prior to the recession. But in today's economy, that's just not going to happen um, for many people. And uh, employers just made such, and I know some of you, I was talking to you earlier, are um, working with companies that made deep cuts uh, in, during the recession. And the rate of, of new hiring is just meager right now. And a lot of people who are returning to work are returning to jobs that are uh, lower paying, but also doesn't match their skill sets. And what, the reason this is an important issue is that this is an erosion of human capital across our country. Uh, because it's being repeated million times over, that can dampen our economic um, productivity in the long term, which has uh, adverse consequences for our uh, future standard of living. Now, academics have also been debating whether this, uh, ex whether the extent of this recession has fundamentally changed the structure of our labor markets. Uh, that is, they're saying that there's a mismatch between the types of skills employers are seeking versus the um, skills that the labor force actually has to offer. Some economists have argued that the deep recession has sig significantly changed um, the so-called rate of natural unemployment. That's the rate of unemployment when the economy is firing on all cylinders. And it's typically been about 5%. They say that um, if this natural rate of unemployment has increased, that there is not much that monetary policy can do to address the unemployment um, situation if it is a structural situation. So as a, a policymaker, I need to under, understand better how much the sharp rise of un, in unemployment has been driven by cyclical problems versus structural problems. So the economists at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland have been studying this issue and they conclude that most of the rise in the unemployment that we have in our country today is cyclical, not structural. 
And if there is a rise in the natural rate of unemployment, it's likely to be small. Put another way, the most important reason employers are hiring so slowly is that their business activity has been so slow to pick up. There's, not a, there's a lack of demand there. It's not because there's a mismatch between the employer's skills or the worker's skills and the, uh, the jobs that are available in the workforce. The Federal Reserve, um, the Federal Open Market Committee, was given a dual mandate from Congress. And that mandate is to pursue conditions that will lead to maximum employment and price stability. So it's clear that the economy is not yet close to maximum employment. And because I expect hiring to strengthen only gradually, the unemployment rate is likely is, is uh, likely to remain elevated for quite some time. In fact, I don't expect the unemployment rate to fall below 8 percent before 2013. So we're, again, short of the mandate on maximum employment. So let me turn to the second part of our dual mandate, and that's price stability. My definition of price stability is an inflation rate that is running about 2 percent in the long run. Today, um, there is a lot of uncertainty about the direction of inflation, the price level, more uncertainty than I can remember in a long time. Some people think we're set to see inflation take off, while others are worrying about the risks of disinflation. So given these range of views, um, let me walk you through some of my thinking about the inflation outlook. When I consider where inflation is heading, I look at uh, three factors, core inflation, unit labor costs, and inflation expectations. So I'll comment on each of these factors and explain how they fit into my um, outlook for inflation. Uh, first is core inflation, which today stands at record lows. Um, I rely on core inflation measures because they're a better predictor of future inflation than the CPI, the Consumer Price Index itself. A critical challenge in engaging where inflation stands now is to get beyond the noise that is sometimes in that CPI data and to look at the underlying core rates of inflation. And the most widely referenced core inflation measure is known as the core CPI, which simply excludes food and energy prices. And the October CPI data became available yesterday, and they show that the core CPI was flat last month and that the 12-month percent change in the core CPI fell to a record low of 0.6%. When you really drill down into the, those numbers that were released yesterday, you'll find that nearly 40 percent of the items in that consumer market basket showed price declines, while just 12 percent of the consumer market basket showed price increases above 3 percent. And of course, in any given month, any one of those components, more than food or energy, can move in a way that um, is just not connected with that underlying trend in inflation. So for that reason, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland uh, publishes what we call the median CPI, which eliminates a lot of the noise uh, in the price data, uh, more so than the core CPI does. The median CPI also does a particularly good job of predicting future inflation, uh, the future trend in inflation, again, better than the CPI does itself. And I'm not the only one that relies on the median CPI uh, because it is one of the most uh, popular features on uh, our bank's website. And currently, the median CPI is also at a record low. Um, it is at 0.5 percent on a 12-month uh, basis. And as I mentioned to you, my definition of price stability is 2 percent. So both of these core measures are falling well below that measure. Uh, the second element that shows the direction of inflation is unit labor costs. Uh, and or output per labor hour, and that consists of two components, labor compensation and labor productivity. Now, while higher, um, product, higher productivity is always good uh, for longer-run prosperity and for the economy, it also is critical for the near-term outlook for inflation, and higher rates of productivity uh, growth reduce the amount of labor that's needed to produce any amount of goods and services. 
and in today's labor, uh, labor markets, wages are likely to be constrained because of the unemployment situation. Labor supply is far exceeding labor demand. So combining rising productivity and restrained wages because of the, um, the, the fact that uh, the cost of producing goods and services is falling, and the data now show that unit labor costs have fallen by 2% over the last um, 12 uh, months. So labor costs are also falling. And the third element in my, when I assess the direction of inflation is inflation expectations. And this element is especially helpful for uh, forecasting inflation in the longer term. And again, for some time, we at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland have produced a model that helps us uh, assess inflation expectation. And it, it, this model draws measures from the broader financial markets. And in the latest release of our inflation expectation models, uh, which we actually um, developed in collaboration with Peter Richkin, who's here at Case Western Reserve Uni University, um, our model now shows that inflation expectations remain below 1.5% for the next 10 years and well below 2% as far as the eye can see. So given the momentum toward lower inflation rates and the sizable slack that we have in labor markets, um, I expect core inflation to remain quite subdued through, two, uh, through 2013. Now, although I don't expect a general outright decline in the general level of prices, with the demand in the economy still weak and unemployment so high, further disinflation does remain a risk in my outlook. And I take this risk seriously because in periods of significant economic slack, very low inflation does risk tipping into deflation. And admittedly, deflation is a rare modern experience in industrialized economies. Nevertheless, Japan's economy has been struggling for several decades, and scholars point to deflation as the root cause of that um, struggle. So at least over the next few years, my outlook leaves the economy falling short in both parts of the Federal Reserve's dual mandate maximum employment and price stability. At the same time, it's important to recognize that all forecasts come with uh, some risks of surprises, both good and bad. And there's plenty of room in my forecast for surprises on the upside, uh, but there's relatively little room to act against any negative shocks to either output or inflation at this stage of our recovery. So with that as the backdrop, the question I faced heading into the last FOMC meeting was whether further monetary policy stimulus could improve the situation. And could it improve the situation at a reasonable ratio of benefit to cost? In other words, could a more expansionary monetary policy ease financial market conditions in ways that would promote some additional growth in spending, output, incomes, and employment? And could this extra boost, modest uh, though it may be, also act to counter any lingering disinflationary pressures? As an important consideration for me was not just the potential cost of taking action, but also the risk of doing nothing. Despite you know, prior actions by the FOMC up to that point, I concluded that there were enough negative risks to growth and disinflation in my outlook to merit taking steps that would protect the economy from those risks. Of course, um, we couldn't provide a more accommodated monetary policy by lowering interest rates. I mentioned that the Fed funds rate, which we target, was already at near zero. So, in order to provide further accommodation, we would need, that would have to come through another round of large-scale asset purchases, much as uh, we did in um, 2009. And as I contemplated the potential benefits of further large-scale asset purchases, I recognized several potential costs as well. Uh, let me pr describe two of the costs that I assessed. First, I considered the potential for an undesired increase in inflation and inflation expectations. If the public 
started to question whether the Federal Reserve had the ability to manage our balance sheet in support of price stability. And this risk has been rec recognized for some time. Um, so the Federal Open Market Committee has spent a lot of time during this past year preparing for, for an orderly exit from our accommodative monetary policy stance. You know, people forget uh, that the first part of this year, there was a lot of attention around whether we could exit and start to unwind our large balance sheet. And so we, we talked a lot about our exit strategy, and we developed tools that would allow us um, to, uh, to start to remove our accommodation when the time came. And so we, without a lot of fanfare, we developed tools that we expect that are going to be very effective when the time comes to use them. If we do begin to see a buildup in undesirable inflationary pressures, I'm confident that the Federal Reserve is going to be prepared to counteract them. Consequently, I'm not overly concerned that inflation will accelerate beyond my price stability objective of 2 percent. The Federal Open Market Committee has had experience dealing with inflation that are as above our objectives, but we have no experience in dealing with outright deflation, and I want to keep it that way. Uh, the second potential cost that I considered is that there could be unintended consequences of these large-scale Treasury purchases, such as asset price bubbles. After all, we don't have a, lot of, a great deal of experience with this tool. Consequently, I wanted to be in a situation that enabled the committee to regularly review the incoming data, economic data, financial data, to update our outlook, and then to make adjustments to our purchases uh, program if needed. In the weeks um, before the FOMC met back in November 3rd, uh, markets were already anticipating further policy accommodation. And we saw evidence of the likely effect of the additional purchases as investors began to move to more attractive opportunities and assets other than securities, such as stocks and bonds. And these reactions are part of the process by which an easing of financial conditions challenges more funds to borrowers who are going to use them to purchase goods and services, hire people, and generally spur economic growth. So I found these developments encouraging. So putting it all together, um, my choice was clear. I voted to support additional asset purchases, and I am encouraged by the results so far. For example, inflation expectations have moved closer to my long-term inflation objective just in the anticipation of our announcement, and they've stayed that way. I think our policy action offers the right kind of insurance that the Federal Reserve's monetary policy will support economic expansion while stabilizing inflation and inflation expectations consistent with our price stability mandate. So in conclusion, I've studied the financial and economic situation carefully to determine the right policy actions to fulfill the dual mandate that we were given by con Congress of price stability and maximum employment. And I'm going to continue to do so. I'll constantly be evaluating the cost, benefits, and the results along the way. You know, our, at our FOMC meetings, the members thoroughly debate the policy options. And sometimes we differ in, in opinions. But one thing we don't differ on, and that is the man, our, our commitment to this dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability. You know, we know, we recognize that our economy is facing multitude of challenges and a full recovery is going to take some time. We also know that the Federal Reserve can't solve all of these problems on our own. But responding to inflation and inflationary pressures gets to the heart of what a central bank can do and must do. The main variable that the Federal Reserve can control is the price level. So ensuring price stability is our job, and my belief that by promoting price stability, the Federal Reserve is really following the best course of action to support the economic recovery. So with that, I, um, I was promised by uh, President Snyder that you're going to have some very interesting questions, and I look forward to those questions. And one comment, uh, because uh, some people are listening on the phone, they're going to be passing around microphones to use uh, as you ask your questions. So who wants to ask the first question?
<laughs> All right. Amanda, now in, in, in fairness and full disco disclosure, I have known Amanda Communal since she's about five years old. So this is a friend. So this better, you mean I didn't come up with this, this question? This better, no, no, this better be a friendly question is all I'm saying. Um, can you just describe the committee process and what you go through to reach your decision? That's a, an excellent question. You know, it's, it's um, we are... Um, an interesting organization, and a lot of people uh, comment that um, we we make these policies in secret, and and part of that is because the, the, our meetings are not open to the public. We do release transcript, we release mi a statement following our meeting, we release minutes a, a few weeks after our meetings. In fact, um, Wednesday of next week, we'll release the min minutes of our November third meeting, and then five years after the fact, we do release a transcript, but. Um, but each meeting starts uh, with, um, and first I should say uh, that the people that are sitting at the table are the 12 Federal Reserve Bank presidents and the seven governors, and then a, a few staff people from the Board of Governors and the, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And we start the meeting with a staff um, presentation on the economic outlook. The Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve System has hundreds of economists. Uh, the staff in Washington uh, have developed a model of the U.S. economy, the largest model of the U.S. economy that exists, and they use that model to forecast the economic outlook. And so they present that forecast to us. Then following that staff presentation, each one of the Federal Reserve Bank presidents and the governors gives our views of what the economic outlook, what we think the economic outlook look is for growth, employment, inflation. And so, and then following that portion of the meeting, there is a um, policy go around. So given this outlook, and we try to reach some consensus about the view of how the outlook is unfolding, and then the staff presents policy alternatives. Given this outlook, here are the policy alternatives available to you and the implications for those alternatives. And then there's a go around, and this portion of the meeting has changed um, since Alan Green, between Alan Greenspan when he was chair and, and, and the current chair, Ben Bernanke. In the previous, um, when Alan Greenspan was chair, uh, it, the policy, he started the policy go around with giving us his views on uh, monetary policy. Um, and then we would, we would have our go around. And if you look at the transcripts of many of those meetings, that policy go around generally existed of comments like, I agree, Mr. Chairman, I agree, Mr. Chairman, I agree, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> but under, uh, under Ben Bernanke's leadership, um, that he has the um, participants do the policy go around, give our policy views first, and then he gives us his policy views. So at the end of the meeting, uh, we, we have some, obviously, time to, to, to discuss and debate these various views, and then a vote is taken. Um, and uh, as you know, at this last meeting, the vote um, had one dissent. Now, I have to point out, though, uh, that not all of the presidents vote at each of these meetings. So the fact that there was only one dissent, but you're hearing other voices out there of dissent, it's because there are some, uh, the, the presidents rotate their votes on the meeting. The New York Fed president always votes. Cleveland and Chicago vote every other year. And then the other nine presidents vote every three years. So we get a vote at the table every other year. And as I said, I, this year I am a voting member and um, voted to support the, the move. So that's, how, that's a flavor of how this process takes. You know, we um, typically, again, uh, prior to this financial and economic crisis, we typically had one-day meetings. Uh, and only twice a year would have two-day meetings because uh, it w we would, uh, during twice a year, it was our practice to present our economic forecast to Congress and our report to Congress. But given this financial crisis, we've made several changes. I'm not given the financial crisis. We've made some changes uh, despite the financial crisis, and that is to be more transparent. So we now release our forecast quarterly, and, and you'll, uh, I mentioned that when the minutes are released next week, you'll also see our economic forecast. Um, and we also um, have had more two-day meetings because uh, the issues have been more challenging and there's been a lot, of, a lot more to talk about and think about and debate about. But that gives you a flavor of how this process works. So thank you for that easy question, Amanda. <laughs> yes. Hi. 
Um, so there's been, I guess, a lot of noise about um, other countries that hold debt in dollars, right? And this move would devalue them. So I guess, do you uh, do you, do you coordinate with other central banks with, when you guys make these decisions, or is there some other, or at least consider? I don't know. I just read this, and you know, no, that's I, a very I don't good know question. what you guys do. The um, uh, the answer about coordination is uh, no, we do not coordinate with other central banks um, because our, as a central bank, we have responsibility. I mentioned uh, our we have a man the mandate from Congress is um, maximum employment and price stability for the U.S. economy, and so we enter uh, these meetings, go into these meetings, and and base our policy decisions on trying to achieve those objectives. Now, um, clearly, the, our, we take into account what's happening elsewhere in the world and, and, and how, and we take that into account in terms of what that does to our, the outlook for our economy. And that's when a lot of those uh, factors are, are considered. But we do not coordinate our policies um, with central banks. The, the one time where we did, um, during this financial crisis, there were several occasions where we jointly um, uh, made announcements on um, swaps of, of uh, cur currency swap lines that we've created to help facilitate liquidity in U.S. dollars across the world. And so that is one period of time when we did make joint statements and coordinate our actions on swap lines. But in terms of our monetary policy, that's made independently by each central bank for their uh, for their country or in terms of the Eurozone for the, for the Euro countries. Yes, Joe. Do you proactively solicit input from like local business leaders when you're formulating your um, plan of action or deciding what to do before you go to the meetings? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's one of the, the real um, benefits of a decentralized central bank. Uh, when our founders, Barbara mentioned that, uh, I was just at a conference at Jekyll Island where the concept of the Federal Reserve System was, um, was uh, developed by Senator Aldrich and some bankers. And there was a lot of controversy back at the time when the Fed was created. There was a group that wanted the central bank to be like most central banks at that time, which were arms of the Treasury or, in, uh, or the finance ministers. But in, there was also another group uh, in Congress that wanted the central bank to be owned and operated by commercial banks and to be spread across the country. And so what we got was a compromise. The public aspect of the Federal Reserve System are the governors in Washington. They are political um, appointees. They are appointed by the president. They go through the... Uh, Senate confirmation process. And the 12 reserve banks are independent. Um, we have a board of directors, and that board of directors meets every 14 days uh, to make a recommendation on the, disc on the discount rate. But the reason I'm bringing it up in answer to your question, every 14 days they're giving me input on what they're seeing in their businesses and, um, and their regions because they're spread across the district. In addition, we have um, business advisory councils that we meet with on a regular basis to get input. And then I meet with business leaders um, across my district. And it's especially important at times like now when, when economic models, as good as they are, and I mentioned we have the largest model of the U.S. economy um, at the Board of Governors, as good as those models are, um, at periods like this, especially uh, during finan they, they have a, they're not good at capturing financial crises. And um, the other thing is that our models are based on historic experience and data. Well, we don't have a lot of data for an experience like the one we've just been through. I mentioned that the last time we had a crisis like this was the, the Great Depression. And we weren't collecting a lot of economic data um, at the levels that we are today back in the Depression. So our models aren't as helpful um, in periods of time like this where they don't, they're not, and we're now a lot of work, and may, maybe many of you, if you go on, some of you go on to, um, get your PhDs, can do uh, some work on dissertations uh, in, in developing models that are better at capturing financial crises and uh, financial activity in the economy. So we, our models um, are, 
are not helpful, as helpful as, as they usually are, and direct input and information from businesses and um, bankers and community leaders are, are, is just critical at this time. And when we meet, I mentioned in that go-around when we are talking about our economic outlook, the presidents at that time spend a lot of time um, relaying data and information that they're getting from the businesses uh, that they meet with. So that's been very critical um, information, as uh, important information that we've been getting, especially during this uncertain time. Um, given that something like 20 percent of uh, mortgages are underwater these days, and uh, apparently contribute a great deal to the uh, uh, labor immobility that causes structural unemployment. I saw numbers like one and a half per uh, percentage points out of the 9.6 percent uh, would be due to that. What do you think the uh, the Federal Reserve can do about that? How can and, and what role do you think that the uh, the housing crisis plays in the current situation? Well, it's you know, it's clear that the housing crisis has um, you know it it was the the cause of the financial crisis and, and therefore has been um, uh, obviously a contributor to the challenges that we're facing today. The, the continued stress in housing, the fact that even yesterday, again, we got some housing data that showed that you know, housing starts are still extremely low levels. Um, and, and as you mentioned, mortgage uh, situation is still a challenge. So it is contributing to this low recovery that, that we're seeing. In terms of what can we, we do about it, the, the best thing that the Fed, Federal Reserve can do is um, to contribute to a, a better economy. So the policy actions that we're taking um, to provide support to this recovery and, again, to ensure price stability is the best thing that we can do for um, this, the housing situation. It's just going to be a situation that's going to take a long time to, to resolve. Um, there, are, there have been, you know, a lot of, we've done a lot of work in the Federal Reserve System to try to, uh, to look at some of the causes of, of the housing crisis, but also some of the programs that might be able to support um, the housing uh, situation. And, you know, the number, w what we've learned in our research is the number one reason that we have more foreclosures in this area of the country, and Cleveland has been called the epicenter of foreclosures, is um, primarily because of the weak economy that we've had. Uh, in this area. So a weak economy is a large contributor to the housing um, situation. There are others, obviously. We all have read reams and reams of, of stories about um, in subprime lending, inappropriate, un, inappropriate underwriting, et cetera. Um, but the weak economy is, a, is an important cause. So we've been working with um, the uh, Housing and Urban Development Department to, to come up with some uh, programs to help the situation. We've also made some proposals to, to change a, reg, a, reg, a regulation that we're responsible for enforcing um, the CRA, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, and uh, working to see if there are some changes that can be made to that act to enable uh, banks to get CRA credit uh, for uh, some uh, work in actually tearing down um, homes that are vacant and foreclosed and, and, and actually preparing properties for future use and things like that. So there's been a lot of work that we've been doing to look at this housing situation because it is critical uh, to the, the recovery and a stronger recovery. Uh, yes. Um, so on behalf of... Uh sort of local manufacturers uh, in, in, in your district. Um, I'm wondering what considerations uh, would be appropriate um, given sort of policies around quantitative easing uh, and, and the analysis that the Fed is engaged in with respect to sort of uh, uh, perhaps counter responses from, from other um, economies? Uh, you know, are we, are we expecting sort of responses from uh, China and, and the EU? Again, um, 
when you say responses, uh, um, they can come in many ways. You know, the situation we had, uh, we faced prior to the recession was a, a trade imbalance. Um, we, we, in other industrialized countries, especially many European countries, had large trade deficits. And the opposite flip side of that is that a lot of the emerging economies, China and other Southeast Asian econ economies, had huge surpluses, trade surpluses. And so that was an unsustainable um, situation. And, you know, situations that are unsustainable are going to have to change over time. And so, you know, we have seen uh, movements in, uh, and a lot of discussion about how to, to improve that trade balance because it, it is important uh, for uh, not only you know, our future but, uh, but for global um, for, for, the, for the global economy. And what, we're, what I am concerned about is that um, we've been hearing a lot of talk about um, trades and, and putting up trade barriers or um, because of this concern. And, you know, what, what economists have, have known for, for centuries is that, you know, free trade is uh, the best, uh, free and open trade uh, is the best uh, for the global economy in general. I think people look at trade as will win and you lose is a zero sum, sum game. And, and it's not at all. Uh, we've learned again from experience that open trade uh, is beneficial. It's a win-win. It's, uh, it's beneficial. So we've got to be very careful as these as economies uh, like our economy and, and the European economies and other economies, Japanese, are, are, are slower to recover. Uh, we've got to be careful uh, not to turn to trade wars uh, to fix to fix that as a as a solution to the situation. Uh, we all need to focus on providing policies that will will spur growth uh, in our economies and work across countries to make, to ensure that we keep trade open, fair, free. And that, in the long run, will be beneficial not only to our country, to China, and to the global economy. One of the great things about my job is getting to introduce Sandy. One of the hard things is having to tell you all that she has to leave. But <laughs> Sandy, I want to thank you very much for allowing our students the opportunity to hear directly from you about what's going on in the economy. And I'm really grateful. Students, you have your assignment. Get to work on a model that better predicts the financial crisis. I'm sure we will be right back to you with something. Thank you all, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Sam, very much. For your